Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. My name is Leslie. Can you see me? (laughs) I worried myself sick that you would be able to see me over this big podium. Um, I want to thank Mary C. and Russ B. for asking me. Um, It took a little bit of doing. Um, They actually, if I'm not mistaken, asked me last year, and um, something came up. And they hounded me relentlessly. <laughs> no, no, um, I, I have been blessed with a very big life because of the things that I learned in these rooms, um, in other rooms. Uh, I'm a double whiner, as they, no, winner, winner, double winner. Um, and I'd also like to address, you know, we, for our, no one really stood up as new, but I'm sure there are people who are, uh, either uh, not standing up or, or newer. And we have a creed where we do we, we keep Al-Anon as the focus, so we don't talk about um, our other uh, programs. We don't talk about uh, um, our job, our, um, our religion, this and that. But I remember when I was a kid, my mother would say to me, you know, honey, just because it pops into here, it doesn't have to come out of here. And so sometimes I may accidentally, and it's not that I don't um, have respect, there's reasons for those, but... Uh, Anyway, because of the 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 uh, the years that I've spent, I have ten years in the program of Al Anon. Um, and uh, I uh, have been given this really big life, you know. I won a prize in my profession. I'm an actor and I won an Emmy, okay? No anyway. <laughs> But uh, it has to do with me standing here. I I thought at that point, that was in 2006, that I was set career-wise, and it just went in the shitter. I mean, I don't know what happened. But because of that, I um, I had to reinvent what I did, and I hit the road. You know, I wrote... A one-person show, which is basically, it was called My Trip Down the Pink Carpet, and it was basically my Al-Anon journey. Um, And I have now done that show everywhere from the West End of London to Off-Broadway to uh, 45 cities a year I do this performance. Now, what happened, and the reason that I had hesitated when Mary and Russ asked me to speak, not too long ago I was at the podium in in another program that I'm in, and I, I, you know, if you go and perform your story, (laughs) you tend to embellish, you know, I mean, that's part of it. And I called my sponsor and I said, I'm, I don't know what the truth is anymore, and I feel disingenuous. You know, I'm not here to make people laugh. You know, it's a gift that I've been given, and I I love that, the fact that I can make, what a gift, to be able to make people laugh. But I don't know what the truth is. And he suggested a sabbatical. He said, you know, just take some time away from the podium. People do that, Leslie. And I said, but, you know, that's sort of turning down a request, which I've been always taught we don't turn down Al-Anon requests. You know, when we're asked to do something, we do it. But um, anyway, so uh, when Mary and Rust asked, this was a while ago, you know, and at the time I was in the midst of my sabbatical. It was very dramatic. <laughs> <A lot> of- <laughs> You know, you called me up and asked me to speak, and I didn't just say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, I had to give you the whole story, you know. (laughs) You know how we are. Um, 
I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> but anyway, I was in the midst of this very dramatic sabbatical, but I have now realized, you know, lighten up, come on, you know, you just tell the truth, and you tell the truth, and you tell the truth as best you know it, and if all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's not the truth, then you stop and you... You don't even have to say it out loud. You think, oh, no, no, that's the stage version. Uh, let's get back to reality here. But I am, um, like I say, I had been in another program, and I had had some success, you know, five years in that program. And I met a young man, and he had chipped teeth, tattoos, dirty fingernails, you know, right up my alley. And... <laughs> He also had a, a horrendous um, crystal methamphetamine problem. Um, more puzzling to me was that he was a sex addict who was also um, HIV positive and would have these sort of horrendous slips where he would end up in the sex clubs you know, the bathhouses and where, where we gay men go. Well, we, we went, we used to go. Uh, anyway, and I took him under my wings and having absolutely no Al-Anon, I made the conscious decision that I was going to put my life on hold. And I thought that was so brave of me and so generous and I'm a giver. And so I was going to put my life on hold and I was going to save this young man because I I recognized what I thought no one else recognized and that was that he needed saving and um, I moved him into my home and his two dogs and uh, he began to heal and kind of no longer needed me and I end up in a, in a, in a, in a fetal position on the bathroom floor um, and I remember talking to my sponsor in another program saying I didn't work this hard to stay sober, to be, to be in this much pain. And I have to tell you, if anyone's new, um, I've gotten over a lot of addictions in my life, you know, drugs, sex, crystal meth myself. Being, getting over an addiction to another human being <laughs> is the hardest thing I have ever been through in my life. And anyone who's in the throes of that right now, and it's an addiction, you know. I talked to my sponsor on the other program, and I loved what he said. He said, this program has taught you to live without, and now I'm going to send you somewhere to learn to live within. And so I went to my first uh, Al-Anon meeting, and if you're new, we recommend six because it takes a while to hear the language. If you're coming from any other re recovery program, you have to also realize that this is a different program. First of all, I had been in this other program where they had said, take the focus off yourself and put it on others. Why are you so selfish? And then I come in here and you say, take the focus off others and put it on yourself. <laughs> and I'm thinking, where the F is my focus supposed to be? <laughs> and um, my, my, my struggle early on with Al-Anon, and if you're new, is just trying to figure out what this program is. When I hear someone say, my mother was an untreated Al-Anon, well, what? What does that mean? Um, is it a disease of loneliness? Is it a disease of, of, of codependency? Is it, you know, that we're messed up because our parents drank? I, the first thing I heard when I thought, okay, I kind of get it. Someone said from the podium, if you are trying to figure out the behavior of another person, especially if that person is in the throes of addiction, and I love the fact that I hear in my other program, alcoholism, I see it as a matter of semantics. Alcoholism is the disease. You know, it can manifest itself with a, a, an addiction to drugs, to sex, to work, to 
but my current struggle is internet porn, but we won't go down that road. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a disease of more. And if you are trying to figure out someone that is dear to you, their behavior, there can be no healing. Now, this can also include their behavior years ago. You know, if my parents loved me, then why did they behave thusly? If you are trying to figure that out, there can be no healing. That is our surrender in these rooms. It's where we just finally say, I cannot, people, I am, I am powerless over people, places, and things, and the only thing that I can change is my reaction to. Now, this young man that I was so obsessed with um, would end up, I don't know if he had slips, I, I don't know what, but he would disappear. And I was, you know, cruising parking lots of sex clubs looking for his truck. What did I think I was going to do? Like go in there and pull him out of the orgy? You know, I mean, what did I think I was going to do? I had a key made to his apartment. For what? Well, you know, you never know. You got to check. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I would get off the exit at Kawanga and I, I was, well, we didn't even call it then. I, I'm, I'm a stalker. I'm a stalker. I stalked. We didn't hear about it as much back then as you do now, but I stalked this young man to the point of where he would sit me down and say, this has got to stop, honey. You know, you've got me on some pedestal, and I'm not all that. Now, what was interesting, I got into Al-Anon, and I got, I thought I'll use the same sponsor. No, 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 no. And I got a sponsor named Bill, and he uses his name, so I'm not, I haven't heard, I haven't heard from him in years. Bill was my first sponsor. And uh, he had gone through something very similar, only his young man had put a gun to his head in the living room and blown his brains out. And so I was told to talk to Bill about this. And Bill sat me down and said, okay, honey, these are the rules. You're lucky in that there's many of us. I love the fact that in Al-Anon, they didn't tell me get rid of him, you know. There's many people in Al-Anon, you hear it about all the time, that stuck by the alcoholic for years and are with the alcoholic today. And that's what we promise, is that you can, you can be happy with whether or not he or she is drinking or not. You know, that's our thing. Now, that's not my story. My story was that my sponsor said, this addiction you have to this young man is just like any addiction. And I suggest... You know, in our literature, it says we don't even give advice. Hello. But anyway, you know, we suggest and we highly suggest, you know, <laughs> like do it or get the F out of here. You know, um, he highly suggested a, and it's so funny that I used that word earlier, a sabbatical. He said, you've got to, it's got to be time apart. How long? That was my first question. But how long? Well, honey, I don't know. A while. I mean, are we talking years, months? What are we talking here? I didn't think I could go a day. I'm dead serious. I did, th I did not think I could go a day without knowing what this young man was up to. And I think the greatest gift in the world is that I can wake up today and not have to worry where he is, what he's doing, whether or not he's using. Oh, what a gift. You know, I don't have a current qualifier in my life. You know, it doesn't mean that I, you know, I hear that term a lot. New, new people, our qualifier is sort of the one that drove us into these rooms, be it our, our dad that drank or our uncle that drank or our spouse that drank or, or used or whatever. Everybody I have ever met are my qualifiers, you know. I, but I, but I don't currently have anyone uh, that is abusing drugs or alcohol in my life. But I'm still, you know, in the rooms um, because the big realization was that the problem was not 
You know, I have been attracted to alcoholics since I was 14 years old. You know, when I was 14, I wanted my, my dream in life was to get to San Francisco and be a hippie. And I grew, I looked like a rock and roll troll doll. I had like all this, <laughs> all this hair and my, my idols were, were people who are dead now from the disease of alcoholism, you know, were the Janis Joplins and the Jim Morrisons and the Jimi Hendrix. And I just wanted to be, and I love drug addicts. You know, I can walk into a room and find the one heroin addict out of the whole room, and that's the one I want. I don't know what that is. My sponsor says to me, why are you so attracted to cripples? I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't know what that's about. I will tell you this. A heroin addict will never leave you if you have a little bit of money. <laughs> you'll, you'll get healthy and want them to leave you, and you cannot get rid of them. But, but I, I came to these rooms with a long, long history of falling in love with straight men. I'm a gay man who has never once been in a relationship with a gay man. I've had over the years many relationships and they go, people say, Leslie, that's not a relationship. Well, honey, yes. You know, to me it was, you know, they didn't even know they were on a date. They were just out grabbing a bite to eat. <laughs> They're just out grabbing a bite to eat. And I've planned my outfit and <laughs> waited all day and thought about what all we're going to talk about. And, but you know, you think to yourself, well, that's, that's unavailable, you know, that's falling for people that are unavailable to you. And so, and I didn't realize at five years in my other program that that was my final hurrah, that that was what was keeping me from any kind of serenity was these, these, these fantasy affairs. And, you know, as I look back, I think, okay, come on. I grew up homosexual in the Deep South, and it was the 1950s and early 60s, and when when the other boys were dating girls and breaking up and they were learning how to love, how to deal with that, where was I? I was on the back row of homerooms staring at Freddie Ellis, the quarterback, creating a fantasy. And then I'd break up with him, you know, because of that cheerleader. Oh, I hated her, you know. And then I'd go with this other one for a while. And I lived a total fantasy life. And I want to say that today, you know, I am closer to my authentic self than I've ever been. I'm 58 years old. I, I am happier than I've ever been. And I owe all of that to the work, the work, I mean work, that I've done in the program of Al-Anon. I I sat down with my sponsor and I told him everything. And it's shameful, you know. Yes, I do his laundry. Well, there's might be underpants involved and you know, I might anyway. You know, I mean it's shameful. It's shameful, you know, the things that I had to tell that man, the links that I went to because of my obsession with this young man. And he said to me, Okay. Here's the deal. I don't want you to see him. I said, but we go to the same meetings. He said, there's 1,700 meetings. You walk in, you see him, you be light, you be polite, and you go to another meeting. You're not to ask other people about him. You know how we do. Anyway, at least I do. I'm sure you don't. But <laughs> anyway... He said, and this really blew me away, he said, you are not to masturbate and think about him. I thought, how do you know? <laughs> he said, you are not to, and it just went down the road. And I thought, I, you know, I don't know. I can't. And I had slips. You know, it would be Valentine's Day. And I'd think, now what would a call hurt? You know, just see how he's doing. You know, la, la, la. And then it would all come back because num he would either not return my call, which sent me into a spin, or he would 
call me and everything he said was subject to um, my dissection. Well, he really said this, but I bet he meant this. And what if he blah, 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 and la, la, la. It was ridiculous, you know? And there was one thing that I held on to. Bill LaValle, my sponsor, said to me, I will make you two promises, Leslie, if you'll do what I ask you to do. Number one, I can promise you that the day will arrive when you will call me and say, you know what, honey, he ain't all that. Come on. I mean, he's doing the best he can with the light he has to see with. He's a spiritual child of the universe and everything. But for me to have gone through all of that and to have given him complete and utter power, I love this. One time I heard a lady in, in Al-Anon say, people would ask her, how you doing? And her husband would be standing there and she wanted to say, she said, I didn't say it, but wanted to say, how am I doing? Stick a thermometer up his ass. That'll tell you how I'm doing. I don't know. You know, whatever he's up to, <laughs> if he's happy, I'm happy. Happy, you know, and so, so that's he said. I'll make you two promises. You're going to call me up one day, and it infuriated me. I didn't think you people understood. I didn't think anybody understood the depths that I loved this boy. I even went one time. He said to me, "You need to go to a therapist, and I have a good one." And he sent me to his therapist. And all I did was pick her brain about him. And she she finally said to me, honey, you know, I can't tell you his journey, his problems, his story. And this is probably a little unethical, but she did say this. She said, I will tell you this, honey. He has a long history of letting people fall in love with him that he has no intention of having a relationship with. You, on the other hand, have a long, long history of falling in love with people that are not available. And I think the two of you have collided for huge life lessons Here's where my brain went on the way home. Books will be written <laughs> about our love. You know? <laughs> we have collided. We have collided for life lessons. You know, and books will be written and songs and people will talk about us long after we're dead. <laughs> I mean, just insanity and but the two things he promised me were, number one, you're going to call me up and tell me he ain't all that. And I remember thinking, well, good luck. Don't hold your breath. Because at the time, there was a song that came out about white uh, Dido or something. And it was about, I'm going to hold the white flag and I'm going to go down with the ship. Because this, you know, and that was it, you know. And, and of course, any, any. The queen of codependent anthem is my dear friend Tammy Wynette. So, you know, I would play stand by your man, give him some arms to cling to because he's just a man, you know, and cry and gnash my teeth and carry on and carry on and carry on over this boy. But my sponsor, the second thing he promised was when I perked up. He said, Leslie, if you'll do what I ask you to, if you'll even attempt to do what I ask you to and some time goes by I can assure you it will never hurt this bad ever again and I just went I thought you know because that that kind of pain when I think back I was physically sick I can remember the the day of surrender I don't even know if they have meetings there anymore but there used to be a little like a Caribbean cafe on Sunset Way in uh, Silver Lake, Tropicana. And I was at the Tropicana and I had that boring, you know, that I shouldn't say it, but you know, that, um, what's that commitment where you go to the meeting and it's, you then relay back from the central office. What's that commitment? What? Yes. What's it called again? Yeah. Boring. Enter. <laughs> I was the intergroup rep. <laughs> I'd been roped into that one. And I had to go to this meeting, you know, to find out. And I remember sitting there, and I had worried. 
I'll just tell you the truth. I had used a key and I had gone into his apartment and I had found a cock ring in the shower. And it sent me into such a tailspin because I thought, what would he need for that in the shower? And who was with him with that in the shower? I mean, it was beyond sick, you know. And I only bring it up not to in any way, you know, offend anybody, but just standing in his courtyard with that key that I'd made, knowing he was at work and found and gone. I mean, that's that's trespassing. That's, I mean, that's just, it's, it's wrong on so many levels. I don't know where to even begin, but I had gone through his shower. I had gone through his entire apartment to find out was he sleeping with anybody. And I found a sexual device in the, in the, um, uh, shower. And I thought I was going to die. And I, I had to go to that effing inner group rep. (laughs) Um, which in terms of what was important to me at that point was nowhere near what was that sex device being used for. And I thought, I pulled over to the side of the road because I thought I'm going to have an accident. I can't think what I'm doing. And I got to that meeting, and I um, I didn't throw up, but I thought I was going to. And I was sick, and I remember I called Bill LaValle, and I said, I'm ready to really do anything you tell me to do because I can't take this. I cannot take this pain. And I didn't work as hard as I did in that other program to feel the way I do. And I began to do the work in Al-Anon. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. This young man was uh, had dreams of becoming a landscape design artist. And he is very successful at what he does now. And I see him quite often. And I sit there and I stare at him because we'll go have dinner. And I look and I think, what was I thinking? He's kind of fat now, too. But anyway, that's not a bad thing. I don't mean that. But I shouldn't have said that. That's awful. But he, you know, he, I thought, what was I thinking? And he had promised me that he was going to build me a garden, you know, when he got successful. Well, that never happened during our... So 10 years later, I get this um, apartment that kind of looks up on the Hollywood sign and has a huge balcony. And I thought, I need a little garden out here. And I called him up and I said, about that garden. (laughs) About that garden, you promised me. Trucks showed up the next day with kumquat trees, Meyer lemon trees. I got my garden, and all I could think about was what that would have meant to me. I mean, it's a beautiful garden now, but what that would have meant to me when I was, you know, going through his shower, finding sex devices. But when when, when Bill said to me, it will never, ever hurt the way it does, I, I find it interesting now that um, stove hot, ouch, stove hot, ouch. <laughs> that was what my sponsor said. You see him across the room, and you know, you know that's the one, but your picker's broken, honey. You know, your picker is broken. So just think to yourself, stove hot, ouch. <laughs> so... But I um I got into Al Anon and you know you begin to realize that it has nothing to do with him. You know, it goes all the way back to Johnny Talaferro when I was fourteen years old. You know, and I'd give him my lunch money to go in the woods with me. But anyway, you know, it, it, it's just this pattern. And I think that's why we do the step work that we do. I remember I called Bill and I said, this is getting, he said, I want you to, you know, list all of your um, resentments for our new friends. We, we, we used the 12 steps that were, um, uh, came about from the AA program, which came about from the Oxford group, which was a Christian group. And the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous had the wherewithal to realize um, there were going to be a lot of people that weren't of the Christian faith. And so he came up with God of 
our own understanding, which, you know, I, tell, I have to tell you what al reminded me of, Sunday school. You know, I walked in and I, I looked around and I thought, so it's come to this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard, if you're new, it's so funny, um, I had a new friend that went with me the other day and said, they whine a lot in this room. And I thought, you know, I heard that when I was new. It sounded like whining to me, you know, but you find meetings. Uh, there's, we're so lucky that it's Southern California, you know, and there's a wealth of meetings. I cannot imagine, as I said, I travel quite a bit. So I go to meetings out of town where it's the same seven people, sometimes every single night or one night a week, I think I'd kill myself if I had to listen to you every week. But, uh, but I came in and I, like I said earlier, I couldn't find the definition of what this was, you know. And I have to tell you, I still, at 10 years, couldn't really say to you, okay, this is what Al-Anon, I could tell you this, Al-Anon was started by Lois Wilson, who was Bill Wilson, who started Alcoholics Anonymous Wife, and she noticed that these men had drank for 20 years, and the wives had put up with it, and now the men were getting sober, and they were going to meetings, and having socials, and la, 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 and the women were sitting at home thinking, well, hey, hey. Hey, wait a minute. And so she thought, let's get the women together to find a way in which we can support and not enable. We can learn to set boundaries. You know, we can be happy whether they're drinking or not. And it's morphed into that. I recommend al to everyone, you know. Anybody that's having a problem with a relationship, you know, I, re I recommend them to. I didn't grow up with alcoholism in my family. My family was a very devout Baptist. They needed a drink. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and I do think that there is, I do think that my family is rife with alcoholism, but I think the way in which it manifests itself, because we're teetotaling Baptists, you know, I always wanted to be a Methodist because Methodists are Baptists who like to drink, but they're not rich enough to be Episcopalians. <laughs> so we, we were, we were Baptists. And, you know, I, I, uh, think that the way in which the disease manifested in my family was this obsession with religion, you know. And I walked into the rooms of Al-Anon and, you know, you talked to me a little bit about a God of my own understanding and I wanted to scream, you know, I wanted to say, listen, I've been a closet atheist my whole life. From the day I was a little boy, I've been baptized 14 times. <laughs> you know, the preacher would say, I had a secret growing up in the deep south. I thought I was the only queer on the planet. And when the preacher would say, come forward, lost sinner, I'd think, ooh, that's me. And I would go forward, and in my faith, you're baptized once, and we don't sprinkle, honey, we dunk. You know, we dunk, and we dunk just to make sure we dunk three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You are saved. And I would think, well, I don't feel saved, you know, and, and, and I've been out in the woods with Johnny Talaferra, <laughs> and I'm scared of that lake of fire. I was scared to death of that lake of fire. And so that's been one of my really big struggles in Al-Anon is that kind of finding this sort of belief in a God of my own understanding. I had a wonderful lady named Miss Jane Gray, who we buried, who was in both programs, and uh, we buried her this last year. And she was one of these old, old broads, you know, they've just been around, and you can't charm them. See, that's what I found out, you know. They couldn't give a shit that you once guest starred on Murphy Brown, you know, <laughs> Sit down and shut up. <laughs> but you have to understand that I'm a little special here. <laughs> but Miss Jane Gray said to me, um, she said, listen, honey, this whole God thing, she said, why don't you just get a bar of soap and write on your mirror, help. And what that stands for is his or her ever loving presence and you just say help 
And I said, but Miss Grace, see, here's the problem. I don't know who I'm saying it. She said, shh, 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 shh. she said, you also need to learn to shut up because I'm giving you a direction. She said, you write help. And then she said, you find a quiet place. She said, I, I was in re retail and the only quiet place I could find was a toilet stall. But she said, I would, when I got a little squirrely, I love that term. I'd never heard that term before. And for a recovering crystal methamphetamine addict, that's a wonderful word. I'm getting a little squirrely here. But anyway, she said, when you, when you get squirrely, find you a quiet place and just say help. And she said, a good thing to do is to breathe in. She said, that's, that's cool air, see? Now breathe out, warm air. She said, that's life, baby. That's life. And then at the end of the day, you take your washcloth, you wash off help, take your bar soap, you write thank you, go to bed. Life will get better. And, you know, that was sort of my journey. That began this journey to find, because we are not um, newcomers. We're not a religious program, but we're a spiritual program. And I love, I heard this, because I was always so afraid of going to hell, that religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people who have already been there. And I've been to hell and back. You don't have to, you don't have to scare me with, with a trip to the, to the, to the, uh, fire, the lake of fire. But I, that worked for me for a really long time, that help, thank you, and then it didn't work. And I think the wonderful part about the program of Al-Anon is that our, our, our concept of a power greater than ourselves can grow and change as we grow and change. And I've had many arguments where people say, you know, well, God either is or isn't, and la, la, la. Well, that's not my journey. You know, that's not my journey. And excuse me, you, but you're not spiritually damaged like I was. I feel to tell a little boy uh, about uh, a, a red man with horns deep within the earth and you're going to burn, I think that's spiritual abuse. And I think it borders on child abuse. And, you know, so maybe my journey is not your journey. So my journey is... I hear people around the rooms of al -Anon so many times say, you know, I didn't grow up with any religion. And I think, honey, you are so ahead of me. What I had to just discard, what I had to just let go of and get rid of, that stern, punishing God that was going to throw me, and especially because of what I was, you know. Um, and so I, 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 I took that, that advice from Miss Jane Gray, and I have to tell you where I am now. And it's hard for me to even talk about or voice my concept because it seems trivial to me. But what I believe now, and this is just my belief, is that nobody knows whether there is a God or not. Not Oprah, <laughs> not the Pope. Not that Joel Osteen with those chiclet teeth. I don't know if y'all know him. <laughs> He's a big tell. Anybody that's making money off of it is subject to suspicion for me. But anyway, I will honor the sanctity of your religion. And if I'm making fun of your religion, please, I will honor the sanctity of your religion. The only religion I personally embrace is the religion of kindness and the religion of Al-Anon. You know, this is where I come. I wonder, you know, I my mother used to say to me, will you still go to those meetings? And I said, oh, I, I said, Mother, I think it's taken the place because you raised me in the church and everything we did surrounded the church. Our friends, I think at 17 when I made that conscious decision that I didn't believe and I was adrift for so long, I think that's what, these these meetings give me is that sense of community you know that we that I never listen I was not the gay person who went to West Hollywood and felt like I was home you know queers hanging from the trees I never felt you know people 
felt at home. I felt, I feel at home here. I think I exhaled for the first time in my life when I realized, oh my gosh, there's a solution, you know, to this screwed up. My life was just like a, a ping pong, the, what do you, not ping pong, a pinball, you know, bing, 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 just banging through life, just bang, 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 bang. And my life today, I'm going to finish with this. Wow. Right as I said, I'm going to finish with this. The five minute sign went up. I am so happy right now in my life, but the, the Al-Anon within me wants to dissect it. You know, I don't want this to go away. How? And so I recently made a pie about my happiness, you know, and 50%, I would say, is what I've learned in the rooms of Al-Anon and other rooms of recovery. Um, 30%, I have to say, is career success. There's nothing like it. You know, if I'm not going to get on my high horse and say I'm happy. Like if my career went away tomorrow, honey, I don't know. You know what I mean? I have done very well very well, and I am also, without knowing it, um, put together a pension. I, I draw money now. I mean, I don't have to, I'm, I'm not financially set, but I've got a safety net, you know, a monthly safety net. So I have to say 50% is AA, and 30% is uh, is um, career success. And I, that other 20%, and this always opens a can of worms, is when I did walk into the rooms of Al-Anon, my sponsor suggested that I get a little outside help. And I went, and I've always felt that the gray cloud that followed me, I'm what's known as a gregarious recluse. You know, I don't go or do much, but boy, when I'm out, I'm out, you know. <laughs> but I spend a lot of time, and I'm, I have suffered from depression my entire life. And people think, oh, but you're so gregarious and you seem so happy. I read a book once called I'm Dancing as Fast as I Can. And I, that, I thought that sums it up for me. I, I mean, just because I'm not, ooh, doesn't mean that I am not suffering. I'm dancing as fast as I can right now. And I got some outside help, and um, I was put on an antidepressant, which I fought and I fought and I fought, and I... It gave me, I, I had no idea you could go through the day on an even keel. My life has just always been mood swings, violent mood swings. Now, you have to include talk therapy. They always tell you that when you get any kind of help. Hey, there's no better talk therapy than a meeting of Al-Anon, let me tell you, whether you're talking or not. And so, yes, I get lots of talk therapy diet and exercise. People don't talk enough about that. I'm violently hypoglycemic. You know, I'll be very mean one day and think, why are you not working a good program? Because you had a piece of cake last night. And you know, on those days that you have had that piece of cake that you weren't supposed to have, then you should not, and this is, came from my sponsor, you know, you should not lay your shit on somebody else because you had a piece of cake. And you shouldn't make any major decisions today because you had a piece of cake. And <laughs> but for it to get down to that specific, you know, that what do I need for happiness? Well, whether I need career success or not, I'm going to keep at it. You know, I'm going to try to eat right. I'm going to try to I swim 10 laps a day. I can do the butterfly. People marvel. This little old white man. I do the butterfly. I was on the swim team when I was a kid. It's the only sport I've ever done, ever. <laughs> and I can do the butterfly. And I'll do 10 laps a day, seven days a week. And, I, you know, and all of that has 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 brought about a pretty, I, I, I'll finish with this. My mother, when I was a kid, rode me relentlessly because of my manners. She wasn't like that with my sisters, and I don't know why. But I am 58 years old, and I still ask to be excused from my mother's dinner table. If I am sitting here and a woman approaches the table, I get a kick right under the table because one stands up when a woman approaches the table. And it took a long time for me to realize, you know what, that was a lot of work on her part, but I'm a pretty good human being, you know? I'm, I'm mannered, I, I uh, 
anyway, I'm a good human being, and, and I hope that anything I said resonated, and if I broke some al traditions, I apologize, but I love you all deeply, and thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.